Good morning, everyone. We're going to give it a couple minutes. We're just at the top of the hour, probably another minute, actually. Um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Just wait for a few more to come in. Again, thank you for being here. We'll get started in just about 30 seconds, just letting a few more come in. We have a lot of people here today, which is amazing. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We have a lot to get through today, and I anticipate we'll have a lot of questions at the end. My name is Kristen Carpenter, and I'm the CEO and founder of Verity Brand Communications, and I'm here to guide the conversation today. I'm going to just go right ahead and go into our introduction and our in, of the guests, and we'll get right into the questions. But thank you so much again for joining us today. So despite the changes over the years in locations and formats, Outdoor retailer Winter Market's Snow Show has historically served as a vehicle for our business community, but as we can all attest, what got us here most certainly will not get us where we need to be. Our businesses are not the same as pre-pandemic, and they continue to evolve with consumer evolution and ever-shifting COVID-induced business headwinds. Despite the fact that everyone here today seems to have different priorities in their businesses, we're all in agreement 100% on the fact that our national show needs to evolve. Today, you're gonna to be able to make your voice heard on this important conversation. SIA's membership and webinar attendees have unprecedented access today to Hervé Sedke, president and CEO of Emerald Expositions, parent company of Outdoor Retailer. They go by Emerald now. Thank you so much also to SIA president, Nick Sargent for creating this opportunity for the outdoor business community today. Prior to joining Emerald, Hervé spent six years as president of the Americas for events giant Reed Expositions, where he led more than 100 sector-leading exhibitions and events in North and South America each year, as well as the company's global, quirky pop culture and lifestyle-focused offshoot, Reed Pop. Before his time at RX, Hervé spent over 20 years at the American Express Company serving as VP and GM with American Express Global Business Travel. Today, Nick will bring the concerns and insights from SIA's membership to Hervé, and they'll engage in a conversation about the snow show's evolution. Questions from our audience will follow, and a bit of housekeeping on that front, Hervé and Nick will address all the questions we can fit into the hour, and those that are not answers will be addressed as part of the follow-up and sent out to all webinar attendees. A recording will also be available. And to ask a question, simply use the Q&A function on the webinar platform. So with that, we're gonna dive right in. Thank you both for being here today. My first question is for Nick. So Nick, you sold the snow show to Emerald five years ago because the winter outdoor business needed something different, yet still needed a national platform and Emerald definitely provided that. And as the president of SIA today, you spend an inordinate amount of time in your day to day advocating for and listening to your membership. So we're excited to have you here today to represent that. You've shared that you've heard many in SIA's membership believe that national shows are less about org writing and are evolving more to become more of a marketing expo and industry gathering for the community. Others are challenged by the ever evolving buy sell cycle, which has forced the hand of larger brands and smaller brands to find new solutions. Considering all of SIA's member feedback that you've been hearing, what should be the first priority for Emerald to consider as they evolve the show? Well, thanks, Kristen. It's great to have you uh, moderate this again. Uh, we've, uh, we've certainly enjoyed this, this type of discussion. But first and foremost, I wanna thank Harvey for being here. This is a critical conversation and SIA's membership is so thankful that you've made yourself available for the conversation today. So again, thank you. The biggest priority as I see it is that we're starting here today 
having our members' needs heard and hopefully met. I believe this starts by challenging ourselves on both sides to really reconsider what return on investment is for all shows, including the national show. Clearly, what worked yesterday is not going to work for today. ROI is time and monetary investment. Every business is experiencing their own version of change in the buy-sell cycle. The membership is split between the regional shows, the buying group shows, the rep group shows, and in addition, the national show, which many believe doesn't carry the same weight as it once did. So just by having a big space and trying to fill it with as many exhibitors and buyers as possible and hope something happens isn't a strategy. But I'm excited to learn how the national show can evolve to the point where it can serve the business community in a way that's efficient, less redundant, and meets the needs of today's business leaders with all that's changing in our businesses today. That's really a tall order, but that's definitely what we're here to address in Hervé. This one is for you. You bring such great experience to your role as president and CEO of Emerald. And I like that you also have an entrepreneurial streak as the visionary behind ComplexCon. I think I can speak on behalf of the audience today and asking why you chose to take this post with Emerald. Good question, Chris. First of all, I want to thank uh, you, Kristen, and Nick, and, and the entire organization for host for allowing me to, to join you today for this really important conversation. Um, so thank you. Uh, why did I take the job at Emerald? Uh, I started in January, a very difficult time for sure in our, in our industry, but uh, Emerald have a portfolio of phenomenal brands, really leading brands in the sectors that we serve. And that from the outside looking in was extraordinarily appealing to me. And then once I've joined, I can tell you the, the second reason is getting to know the talents, just an incredible group of people, both at the leadership level and all throughout the organization, incredibly talented, um, thoughtful, caring individuals. Um, and, uh, and therefore it made my decision really a, a great one. So very pleased to be here. So can you give us a 30,000 foot view on how you see the evolution of the value of a trade show since you oversee such a big portfolio of yeah. trade shows? Absolutely. No, ha happy to do that. You know, if you think about trade shows, and, and I've said this before, apologies for anyone who's heard it before, but it, it's not a new concept, right? Ancient Egyptians had trade fairs. Um, and so they've been around for tens of thousands of years. They will be around for another tens of thousands of years. So the question for me is not about the platform. The platform is here to stay, is here to stay forever. What I think is really critical is that we have very honest conversations with ourselves and with our customers about what our customers' needs are because it needs to evolve. The way that we did it in the past is not going to work moving forward. We have to, like every industry, change. We have to be, get comfortable with changing the way that actually trade shows happen. So Nick's point is very good one. The notion of renting a very large hall and then inviting a ton of participants, both as buyers and sellers, and just hoping that business happens is something of yesterday. That is not going to be successful moving forward. I couldn't agree with that more. And so the question is, where do we see things going? Where are we investing our time and our money to really create this format that I don't think is at risk, but needs to change and evolve in order for it to deliver, as Nick said, a very strong return on investment to our customers. Thank you. And I know we're going to be getting more into detail on that today, especially as questions roll in, but thank you so much for that, for that uh, answer. So last year, suppliers and retailers invested in quite a range of tech-based and business solutions to get through the COVID compromised buy-sell cycle. Hervé, we're aware that Emerald invested in Elastic Suite and Plum River last year, and I'm sure you're aware SAA's membership have invested in and use a variety of B2B solutions from low tech to high tech. SIA members are really struggling with going back to a national show because so many have implemented business and tech workarounds during COVID. In your view, Hervé, how can a national business gathering be complementary to these new technologies for brands? I'm going to take a step back. I'll, I'll start off by saying that um, I, th these things are not mutually exclusive. The physical and the uh, digital and technology-based platforms actually create a much stronger ROI when they are used together. 
So for me, it's not a question of one or the other. It's a very, very firmly a, how do you use them both together in a really uh, coordinated way so that you can get the optimal results. And so, and, and I'll, I'll step back for a second. Uh, in, in, as you think about demographic changes, Generation Z, for instance, are 24, 25% of our workforce today. So in the current workforce, you have a generation that when asked, 71, 72% of them are saying that in business, they prefer face-to-face -face, uh, interactions. They actually have a really mixed relationship with technology. These, this is the generation that have multiple profiles online. They, they love technology in some forms, but also fear technology in others. And so I think the mix and the future will be as demonstrated by this new generation coming into the workforce, this mix of really, really strong physical platform complemented by a digital presence. And so uh, if I may now answer your specific question around Elastic and our acquisition of Plum River, for us, if you think about it in isolation, that platform is an incredibly efficient way to buy and to sell. It's eliminated, it's streamlined the process, eliminated a significant amount of paper and catalogs. It's just an efficient way to do business. And a lot of our customers uh, and Plum River's customers, uh, when we acquired it, were using that platform. For us, we look at our business in three specific areas. One, events, and the events are both physical and digital, because I think that it, the world will have to go beyond just a physical event, but also to include a digital compo component in the times of the year that you don't have a physical event. The second area is content, what rich, the riches of magazines and content and how we can continue to provide value to customers as defined by content and leads throughout the year. And finally, this transactional platform. So you can be inspired with what you see at the events, you continue to get leads throughout the year. And finally, and very importantly, you're able to transact and buy and sell through this content. So we look at Emerald as not just a trade show company, although trade shows are really core to what we do, but really a, um, a company that's all about connections, that's all about content and commerce. Thank you, that's, that's a great answer. And Nick, to build on that, I have a question for you. We're all living our own version of how COVID has changed and continues to change the buy-sell cycle. I'm hoping that you can talk with the audience here today about some of the factors that play into that, such as the move to B2C, supply chain issues, technology and business investments, as we were just talking about. But And then also, of course, we can't leave out the regional and rep shows and the buying group shows. As we continue through COVID, SIA's membership is truly being pulled apart more than ever before by all of these stakeholders and trends and business factors. And really the exhibitors and the retailers have, they're in a tough position because it's almost like these entities are competing for their the same dollar instead of cooperating, cooperating to modernize the buying and selling experience together. So in your view, Nick, what's the danger of this fracturing that we're seeing within the business community? Listen, I mean, all these groups play a valuable role. I mean, this is what I'm hearing from the members daily, uh, you know, our members are very loyal to the regional and the buying group shows, but they're also telling me that they like to see a high functioning ecosystem and greater unity. They're challenging us to work better together. And we've been talking about this for, for years now that I've been in this role, um, working better together than apart. They want less duplication, more efficiency and effectiveness. We are at a breaking point. We're fracturing in ways that could be irreparable. At this juncture, we should be thinking, you know, cohesively. As the national show evolves, our members want to know that Emerald will take a comprehensive approach on what is the best direction for the national show, because this fracturing cannot continue. Sorry. Um <laughs> Absolutely. And obviously, um, Hervé, you're, you're just in your role in January. So we realize that there's going to be a runway and we again, really appreciate the opportunity to be collaborative here today. Um, I just have to ask, 
I'm sure in your role, you've seen many versions of this before. Um, and I was wondering how you're maybe starting to put a vision together around how Emerald can create an evolved national show that actually includes all these stakeholders so that the system does work better for exhibitors and buyers. All right, don't mean to oversimplify, but I do believe that it's critical. We, we've developed a strategy, three-pronged strategy. One of the most, the first and critical pillars of our strategy is called customer centricity. So the most important thing is really to understand our customers' needs and adapt uh, our solution to meet the needs of our customers. That's what's really critical. So an example of that is, for instance, we've hired a new head of pricing. Uh, we're looking at how we price differently as an example, such that we're able to price for the value that we create. So really allow people to participate with us in more ways than they had in the past to create some flexibility so that customers who have massive budgets, who want to invest in a certain way and get optimal returns, they get that, but others who don't also have the ability to participate and benefit from the experience. That's just one example. We have multiple examples of very specific actions that we're taking to listen to customers and then adapt the solution to make sure that everything we do is really with an eye on delivering on what our customers' needs are. So that's, that's the basis. Of, of what we are. But I do want to address and highlight, if you don't mind, Nick's point on, a na on national shows. Uh, I agree with, with Nick in that a lot of shows have very specific and unique value. A buying show has a very specific value, and that is for customers to see uh, the suppliers of that particular buying group. A national show is a marketplace. It is not instead of, I think it's an addition to. In addition to uh, very unique experiences, whether they're smaller, uh, regional, or buying, you do need in all industries a national full marketplace. Uh, Amazon wouldn't work if it was a small little few niches of the market. It works because it's a massive marketplace with everyone participating. And that is what a national show is. It is a huge marketplace, in this case, physical, that allows the entire industry to participate, buyers and sellers, and for uh, the customers to get the optimal experience from this national experience. And that's what we need to continue to build on and evolve, uh, as we've said earlier on uh, in the conversation. And I do, again, I acknowledge that you're, you know, you're here and you've been in the chair since January. And in our rehearsal call, you said such an important thing, which is basically you're not order takers. You're here to look and find, look at what's going on, which is part of the process here today, and then figure out something that's actually going to become consumer centric. And um, I guess if you could also speak a little bit to um, how you're planning on doing that in a way, obviously you're moving the ship, it's a big ship. Um, and is it just a question of prioritization or how are you planning to, I guess, attack this, if you will, <laughs> if there's a prioritization to it? Absolutely. And I think prioritization is, is in fact, uh, important and critical. We prioritize customer centricity. We said this is the most important thing. I gave you the pricing example. There are many others. There are brand operating plans that we're rolling out across our, our uh, biggest brands, including uh, this brand, of course, around understanding what this experience for the customers, both digitally and physically, will look like in the next three years. Another one is an initiative around event of the future which is how will the experiences be very different when you attend a show today than you had in the past. I believe that they will be extraordinarily immersive. You can walk through a trade show. If you're sitting at a conference, you walk in and through your mobile app or even maybe your glasses, you're able to find out very quickly who your level one LinkedIn connections are and if they're in the room or uh, appointment setting directly into your calendar so that you can meet them later on. So using technology in, a, in an immersive way we will be creating this experience that's different from uh, a, a more traditional experience that exists in the industry uh, today. But it's going to take time. It's going to take investment. It's going to take time, obviously, to create this kind of future. Thank you. And then um, I wanted to, even though we're saving Q&A for the end, there is a question that's really timely for right now. You had mentioned a three-pronged solution. Prong one is you know, customer centricity. Uh, can you again just underscore the second and third prongs for the audience today? Absolutely. I'd be happy to. We have three prong strategy. One is uh, customer centricity. The second one is a 365 uh, day a year engagement. And this goes to the points I made earlier around how we're going to leverage technology 
uh, and digital alongside our physical events. And the third uh, pillar is portfolio optimization. And this for us uh, as a company, it's about diversifying and really launching new shows. We have a very aggressive launch plan to launch new shows and experiences. Some are going to be alongside and perhaps in this particular category, we are looking at a couple of, uh, of opportunities to expand the uh, suite of offerings that we have to our customers. And some will be in completely new categories uh, that we're exploring as well. And also, also we'll be you know, buying more companies uh, and more uh, events and, um, and content plays and, and, and so forth in order to continue to diversify uh, our own business. So those are the three prongs, customer centricity, uh, 365 day engagement, and the third is portfolio optimization. That sounds amazing and exciting. So thank you very much. Um, I also just have to throw this out there because it's one of the reasons we're here today. So the Denver contract is up at the end of 2022 for Outdoor Retailer. What are the key considerations Emerald will have for venue selection for a future show? It's obviously been in the media recently that Salt Lake City is in the running, if you count the governor of, Salt, of <laughs> Utah as the media, um, but it's been out there. And I was hoping you could comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I have not had any discussions with the governor or, uh, but I have seen um, these reports as everyone else I'm sure have. I think what's really critical is going back to our first pillar, which is customer centricity. Ultimately, what's important is to have a show in the location that matters to our customers. And so what's really critical is that we listen to our customers. And when you invited me to join today, this is really, for me, the most exciting bit is to invite our customers to let us know what's really important to them, not just in Location is critical, of course, but in addition to location, what are the things that are really, really critical for us to really focus on and invest in in order to have a very successful show? So for me, it's all going to be based on what our customers uh, want. Awesome, thanks. So I wanted to remind the audience, please submit your questions. We've saved quite a bit of time to um, enable you to ask questions that I'll be feeding directly to Nick and Hervé. So please take the time to do that as we only have a couple of questions left. We left a lot of time for that. So um, we've obviously just spent the last 20 plus minutes discussing what needs to change. So I'm gonna have a question here for both of you. And again, this kind of goes back to the prioritization. It goes to consumer centricity. And there's so many pieces of this, Hervé, I realize. Um, and you've just explained your three-prong approach. Um, obviously, you're dealing with a lot of different markets within your portfolio. But in, the, in, in snow sports and outdoor, we like to call ourselves the passion markets. I've, I've said over and over again, we're special snowflakes in these spaces. Now that you're getting to know us a little bit, and thank you again for being here, What's the first thing you'd change that's maybe the most industry fluent thing you can do with snow sports and outdoor? I think customer, um, customer choice and customer options would be the number one thing that we need to do a much better job at. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of really critical conversations that are going on in the industry uh, at the moment. Uh, it could be sus sustainable purchasing, could be buying, it could be whatever they are, diversity, how do we diverse, diversify our customer base? So there are a lot of really, really essential conversations that are going on. And how do we allow our customers to really show up in the way that they want to show up? I use pricing as an example, but it's not just pricing. It's show up in every single way. It doesn't necessarily have to all be around building booths and so forth. We have to create a lot more flexibility in the experience so that our customers show up in the way that makes sense for them at the price point that makes sense for them in the location that makes sense for them and that we need to change and that we have a real sense of urgency myself and my colleagues at emerald around driving and now um, nick i would love to have you take a swing at that one you obviously are in the trenches with your membership every day um, what would you change first if you were given all like the time and money to be able to do that? <laughs> yeah, that's a loaded question. Uh, there is. <laughs> although we have time in this sec in this session, I don't think we have enough time. Yeah. The here, here's here's what's important, and I hear this frequently. You know, we have a very passionate community, and this community really thrives off off one another. We enjoy rubbing elbows. We enjoy the competition. We enjoy the you know, revelry that we that we experience when we come together. And, you know, 
there has been so much that has changed in the last, you know, 16, 18 months. And a lot of our members have figured out workarounds and how to evolve their business or how to survive their business. Um, in, in most cases, you know, they found out that they can be successful um, without going to a show. But the thing that really comes forward is this desire to come together as a community. And we hear this, as I mentioned earlier, we hear this frequently. And you know, we need to stop, stop creating our future from looking in the rearview mirror. And we got to start looking forward and cohesively building solutions that work for the greater good. This way, we can evolve. And I love what Harry said about you know uh, moving moving uh, terminology you know from a trade show to a marketplace. Um, I'm a believer in technology. Um, I think this industry is and plays from a 365 day position as opposed to 10, 15 years ago when it was you know maybe 180 day position, um, active position. You know, we have the ability to make this change. Uh, I mentioned earlier that if we continue with the fracturing, you know, we're gonna see um, a lot of failure in, in our futures. And I know we don't want that. I don't want that. My team doesn't want that. I know this industry doesn't want that. And uh, we have a, a, a great opportunity to work with a partner um, such as, as Hervé and Marissa and, and Lori and, and the team at Emerald to define what this marketplace looks like in the future. So I think it's it really is up to us. Um, we have the ear um, of, of Hervé and Emerald and we have this amazing opportunity, which I look forward to, to uh, working on. And I know this is just the first of, of many conversations, but this is where it starts. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, and we are now going to open up the floor to your questions. I told you we were shaving a lot of time for this. We literally have a half an hour. Um, so <laughs> please offer more. I've got, um, I've got a bunch here to get through, but my sense of the matter is we're probably going to fire right through these. So I'll go ahead and start with just from the top here. If Emerald sees one bucket of the business to be content, why does Emerald not host an event at the ultimate start of each selling season to highlight the newest, latest, and great products for the selling season. It could be a smaller show for unique products, as we all know that some of the disconnect is due to the selling seasons of different product or industries, outdoor versus ski versus paddle sports versus bike. Now, I understand we might have, um, I don't know if Marissa Nicholson's gonna answer this or Hervé, but um, I just wanted to let you know that Marissa did tag this question and I'm not sure she's gonna step on or if that just is an indicator it's for Hervé, but either way, this is a good question. It is a, it is a good question. I, I would much prefer Marissa to answer it because she'll do a much better job than, than I would, but um, I, I'll give it a start and say that that is exactly the definition of content. That is, that is what we wanna do. Um, and I don't know whether that's in our plan or not at the moment, but I made note of it. And I think that that's a great idea. That is something that we should be doing uh, and adapting our content plan to do the kinds of things that, uh, that the person who asked the question is suggesting. I don't know, Marissa, if you have anything more specific that you can add to this. I don't know if she's live. Is she in the green room? Um. <laughs> She, in the green room. She is here, but she is muted. And I'm trying to, if, if Maria is not, or sorry, Marissa is not able to get to that not question. Please, oh, there she, well, uh, please know we will uh, be answering questions that we didn't have time to get to in our follow-up. And I will be sure and partition some time for Marissa and some attention on that question from her. Um, the next question we have is, can you let us know who your customers are? This is obviously for Airve. The buyers or the entities purchasing space at the show. Both are really important, and that's a very, very difficult question to answer. Right? It's like which kid do you like better? Um, <laughs> I like them all exactly the same. It's a very tough question. Um, I would say though that um, traditionally, as an industry, um, the industry has looked at customers as the the ones that exhibit because they're the ones who pay to show up. However, uh, we have a really clear strategy around 
um, buyers being uh, as important, if not more important, because without the buyers there, you really don't have exhibitors. And so um, I would say they're both extremely important, both play a critical role, uh, but the buyers uh, have needed to take a, a bigger role in terms of importance and investments and will continue and we will continue to invest in that moving forward. Thank you. That's great. Um, here's another great question. When looking at new venues, one of the most expensive parts of the in-person show is basically the venue fees, such as drayage, et cetera. How can you decrease cost of items that have no ROI? And also, how can you increase the ability for demo opportunities? Uh, those are two very different questions. So demo opportunities is definitely in our, in our plan and how we can do more of that. So that's going to be, uh, as we look at the events of the future, uh, we do want customers to show in different ways and demos is gonna be, uh, play a big role. In terms of costs, I have to be really honest, there are some things that are completely outside of our control. And some of the costs that were mentioned by example are very, very difficult for us to help navigate. But I think the ROI is obviously the two pieces. It's the cost and the investment, but also the return. And I th think it's incumbent on us to increase the return portion so that you can make the cost a non-issue. And that is where our focus is. Of course, we constantly try and negotiate lower costs, but in this environment in particular right now, as we look at uh, inflationary environments, lack of talent uh, in, in the business and us all having to pay a lot more for talent uh, to work the shows. Um, I don't want to set an expectation for lower costs because that won't be our reality, at least in the, in the short to midterm. It would be great if we could have that be part of our conversation here today, but you're yeah. absolutely right on that front. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you so much. You guys are doing awesome getting through these. And we have a lot more here. Um, in your mind, what are the top three to five offerings? And in the interest of time, if you want to just hit, you know, one, two, or three, Emerald could facilitate that would compel the snow sports industry to show up at a national show. Well, I think like, you know, I don't know if Nick, you want to, you want to take this as well, but from my perspective, I think it's, it's what I said earlier around um, it, the, the events themselves have to be all inclusive. They have to be a massive marketplace with all the players in the marketplace that are present and participating and benefiting from it, both the ones that sell and the ones that buy. It has to have a richness of content. So when you come to the event, you leave smarter than you came uh, to the event with. You have a lot more insights and information and knowledge and contacts and relationships and leads. And that's really, uh, really important. That would be uh, the second. And ideally, we have the commerce platform playing a role so that our, our customers also are able to streamline their purchasing and are able to buy and sell through the extension of uh, the market, the physical marketplace that they're attending. Nick, I'd love to have you weigh in on this as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh... You know, this is this is something that we talk about frequently. You know, what is that value? And and Hervé uh, hits hits them all. You know, there is a lot of value in the community coming together. And I know um, a lot of our members feel that the price of uh, and, and expense to participate might not justify um, you know the community gathering. It's an expensive party, but you know, if you if you think about all that Hervé just mentioned, you know, you learn more um, um, before before uh, uh, as you leave, and um, than than you had beforehand. You are you are seeing new things. Um, I'm seeing a, a question right here that's distracting me. Mark Harrell, thank you. Um, you know, I find the virtual trade show uh, less satisfying as a seller. You know. Absolutely, you know, we need to come together as a community. And uh, again, whether you're rubbing elbows, you're seeing new brands, you're seeing new products, uh, you are experiencing the education through uh, I and I, you are having new conversations around technology. You're not coming to the trade show as you used to, to write an order, but you're coming to learn about technology, how to advance your business. 
know, if you're not, your competitor is. So it's it has a very competitive feel and environment for that. Um, also, you know, there are uh, there are new exhibitors um, that that are attending the show. There is new technology. There is new product. There are new stories to be had that is only going to influence your perspective as a whole. Um, you know, I would love to love to be able to have a demo, um, uh, a more practical side of of the show that maybe it's in conjunction to as opposed to after or or before. So there's a lot of opportunity there. I think if you're just looking at the show as how many orders you wrote, I think you're missing you're missing the opportunity. And believe me, I know how important that is. So don't don't think I'm being tone deaf. Um, but I do feel like we learn more as a community when we come together. We have a better experience, um, and that's what uh, keeps the passion uh, in, in the conversation. A really good point, and it is important to look at how we are framing what return on investment is or key performance indicators are today, because obviously it's not just a different game. With, it's not just different goalposts that we should have now, it's an entirely different game. So in addition to Emerald and SIA working on evolution, we have to continue to try and prioritize that in our businesses to move ourselves forward as well. So Erby, I have one for you here. You mentioned flexibility as we were going through the initial conversation and showing up as you are. So a sense of nimbleness and really kind of just stepping into the current, if you will, from where you are right now. It would be great if you could better define this and give us some examples. I think it could really inspire some people to maybe get off the fence or get out of maybe and get into commitment one way or the other in terms of just that sense of flexibility and being able to show up as you are when the show is here. Well, I think um, I, I briefly mentioned them, um, but at the highest level, every industry have really core issues that they grapple with. And a face-to-face -face uh, physical marketplace and event is a great place to debate and discuss. It's a great way for brands to show in an authentic way what they really truly stand for. So there could be a brand, there are many brands, but there could be one in particular that really wants to drive an authentic, deep conversation around sustainable buying. There could be another one that really wants to talk more about climate and impact on sustainability. There's another one that wants to talk about diversity and how we need to diversify our customer base. The reality is that physical events are a great platform to have these types of conversations and they can actually show in that way. They don't have to show product and only product. They can show thought leadership. They could show leadership period in very, very important uh, areas that, um, you know, that they, truly passionately care about their customers care about them their employees care about them etc and we have to create that opportunity we cannot in the future you know even in the in the short term cannot be just reliant on selling a piece of you know piece of real estate and asking people to show up we have to help them create that experience and so marissa and her team are working on developing these types of experiences with ideas, not necessarily with totally baked solutions, but uh, ideas that start the conversation so their brand can get inspired by participating in a different way and hopefully will participate in a different way. But I think it's incumbent on us to really go to our customers with options, ideas, creativity, and what we think is uh, needed for the industry and our customers will continue to help us refine that thinking and refine the offering to get it right for them. Again, customer of one, customer centricity uh, is how we want uh, to uh, run our business. Thank you, that's great. Um, and there are some questions coming in around the January 22 show. Um, so I'm gonna throw them out there with the caveat that you know some of the lift that we're discussing here today will take some time, but I still think it would be great to address these questions and then know as a follow-up um, in the rehearsal call that we all did, Marissa had some great things that I can um, you know, offer in to kind of round out this question as well. But there is, I'll take one from a first-time exhibitor who is 
interested in uh, knowing what a realistic level of traffic, a, you know, obviously a legacy, but very important KPI, especially for a brand new exhibitor. What level of traffic are you anticipating in this post COVID event, particularly since ISPO is uncertain? I'll talk a bit more uh, at a higher level in terms of what we're seeing, because I don't know what level of traffic uh, we, uh, I can't uh, predict uh, yet uh, what level of traffic we'll see here. Our shows are uh, typically, and we've run about, I think it's 26 or 29 shows since the end of June. So just to give you an order of magnitude in terms of what we've seen so far, and they range. Um, they range uh, in terms of level of attendance, and the range is actually quite large in terms of it's it's not a it's not a very narrow range, um, but roughly they're about half to slightly more than half the size that they were in 2019. Just to give you order of magnitude, um, and I think we can come back to uh, the audience with more precision as we get a little bit closer in uh, to the show dates. Okay, perfect. And then Nick, did you have anything that you wanted to add there? This is a perfect place where you might be able to bring some of the insights that you get from the membership in a collaborative way to this first time exhibitor in terms of maybe some tips or ideas on other ways to look at return on investment with time and traffic and all of those things that are more legacy. Um, maybe you could uh, talk about a few things you're hearing from the membership in terms of the importance of attending this January's national show. I mean, this, you know, we hear from our, our younger members, I would say, and the importance of coming together as a, a, as a community. And if you maybe put your, your, your uh, historical hat on and remember when you first started in this business at, at one point, you know, the importance of networking, the importance of getting to understand um, um, the buyers, getting to understand your, your competitors or your colleagues in, in the space. Um, you know, all of these are very important for first time exhibitors. Um, also, you know, not waiting for the, the buyer or, or media to come to you, you know, load up your book and, and get those meetings um, scheduled and really do the due diligence. Um, work with um, the Emerald uh, and Outdoor Retailer team to understand the benefits that they provide you uh, as, part of, as part of that um, trade show membership. And, and, and certainly, you know, work with our team um, around um, our initiatives, um, inclusion and, and climate and participation, and the things that will be important to your business as you as you grow and move forward. So there's a lot of tools right at your fingertips. I encourage you to pick up the phone, uh, pick up you know, uh, pick up a conversation, um, be uh, be vocal, use your voice to affect your business, and um, and uh, you know the show and the industry will will in return help you on the back end. Thank you. Um, another really good one that came in um, for Hervé. This person says, I found the virtual virtual trade shows less than satisfying as a seller. Mm -hmm. Is this the future of outdoor retailer? And I think that this person is asking this question specifically because of the hybridization that you talked about around technology and in-person events, sort of that humanization and tech. Um, I wouldn't say it's the future, obviously, that it, there's a lot of uh, dependence upon the pandemic, but do you have anything that you'd like to comment on or shed light on in terms of the process around a virtual show and the components of that that might stay going forward, like perhaps some things that worked well that you plan on keeping? Yeah, I think it's a very good question, and I would agree with the person asking the question that um, as an industry, and, and we've seen it ourselves as well, the net promoter score for virtual uh, trade shows is extremely low. So the, in terms of the value that it creates, um, I, I saw some industry numbers uh, published by UFI uh, uh, recently that were quite in the negative uh, territory. So I think that it was natural when we couldn't come together at all, there was a complete ban on face-to-face -to, -face to try new things. And I think as an industry and as a company, um, it was good that we tried uh, different uh, ways to get customers together to buy and to sell. And we have, I think to your point, Kristen learned a lot. Uh, we've learned what works and what doesn't work. Um, what doesn't work is, is the virtual trade show. What does work though, is the um, 
the constant communication and engagement with customers all year and virtual allows you to do that. So virtual allows you to have a content play and allow you to communicate with customers around data and insight and information and leads all year without necessarily trying to replicate the show floor in a digital way or the physical event in a digital way. And so I don't think that we'll see a lot more uh, of uh, digital trade shows, but I do think that digital will play a big role uh, moving forward. Awesome, thanks. Another great question here. As passion and division are being discussed, it occurs to me a subset of the division is older members of the outdoor community. I guess that's where this person falls in and the younger member needs. All of the passion sports have historically been driven by youth. In addition to retaining corporate brands and retailers needs, how is Emerald looking to make shows more appealing to the next generation? Please be as specific as you can. Um, I, I, I'm not able to answer that with a lot of specificity, but I will say that that is what we're working on. We're working on our uh, brand operating plan uh, to drive the clarity around what we think this entire experience around the physical events, digital uh, editions, the contents piece and the marketplace will look like in three years. In that review, we look at the various generational offerings, whether it's an older generation or a much younger generation engaging in the industry, how are we ensuring that we're relevant across the board? As I mentioned in my opening, Generation Z is 25, roughly 25% 25 uh, of, of the workforce today. This is not a future generation that we have to start thinking about. They're here right now in, in large numbers. And so um, really look at the entire spectrum across all of our brands is something that we're working on. And maybe Marissa can follow up with more specificity around what some of the offerings can be and should be uh, across the board. Okay, that's great. Um, here's another great one that I think both of you could weigh in on. How do we do this national gathering in a more sustainable way, responsible and regenerative way going forward? It's a great question. Nick, you want to start? Yeah, I'd love to. You know, I love that question, and uh, I'm glad that uh, our membership is thinking about this and putting it forward. It really falls directly in line with with the last question, in, in my opinion. You know, as a younger generation um, in this in this industry is looking for more ways to make those connections, there are also um, values that are really important to not only that generation, but, you know, ours as well, Gen, Gen X, Gen Z, and so on. Um, and I do know that Emerald and Outdoor Retailer have done a great job at looking at plastic-free events, reducing carpet, you know, one, there's a cost, of, there's a cost play there, but there's a, there, there's a really sustainable play too that's, that should be um, discussed and, uh, and shared. It's, you know, carpet is, um, is a terrible material, but anyway, um, you know, we have to be looking at this, um, this opportunity of a gathering, again, as I mentioned earlier, to talk about sustainability, climate, inclusion, participation, all these conversations um, continue to evolve. They're not going away. Um, and uh, they're only going to become more important and imperative for our business as we move forward. And so, you know, I don't think that we're going to solve that, that Rubik's Cube this coming January. But over the course of time, we really have the ability to define what we would like the show to be and what, our, what we'd like our industry to be. That's, um, that's how I'm looking at it. And that's how our team is looking at it as well. That's great. I wanted Nick to start because he's really passionate about this. So thank you for that and inspiring. If, if, if I take it to a more tactical level for the specific trade show industry, there are a handful of things that really uh, make a difference. So the first is of course, the uh, energy that's used uh, at the actual venues. So uh, our uh, current uh, focus in negotiations and collaboration with venues to use more low energy lighting is one example. The second, of course, is recycling. Uh, that needs to happen in a, in a much, at a much greater level inside of our shows. There's also a lot of food waste uh, that goes on that needs to uh, be uh, curtailed. 
And, and then there's the whole logistics. One of the prior questions that we got was all around the cost of logistics. Uh, there is a cost of logistics, but there's also a delivery mechanism of logistics. And this would not help the cost. It would actually increase the cost uh, very honestly in the short term, but helpful in the long term, which is really looking at massive upgrades of electric vehicles and or biofuel uh, uh, powered vehicles to really uh, manage the logistics inside of venues. So those are the areas that are more inside of our control with the venues. Then there's a very big part um, it's about 75% of the carbon emitted uh, around trade shows is actually the travel to and from. And uh, there's a really interesting uh, industry discussion here around that. And the reality and what we're starting to see and are trying to quantify is how trade shows are helping reduce travel. So while people are traveling to a trade show, the reality is that by attending a trade show, they very frequently see many, many customers or many, many prospective customers, and as a result, avoid a significant number of trips uh, as a result. And so we are looking at sustainability in a really comprehensive way. We are uh, one of the leaders in the industry trying to uh, look at, uh, uh, for instance, signing a pledge that would get us to zero carbon by 2030. Uh, not We haven't signed that yet, but something that we're very seriously considering in May in the next week or two. So there are a number of initiatives um, that we're looking at because it's an area that we see as critical, uh, not just to, um, to this show, but to all of our shows and to humanity. Great, thank you so much. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in here. So, and I think part and parcel with that in terms of people um, being able to get a lot of things done in one place, which I think historically has been a big draw, I think we would be remiss not to ask about the future of the on snow demo and how that can work with the winter OR shows. And this one is for you, Nick. Can it be better integrated um, and perhaps free to working media as it seems to have lost its appeal due to cost, distance from Denver, no transportation, accommodations, et cetera. Um, we're getting a number of questions on the demo and I do think it's really important to address just in terms of the touching and feeling and testing of product and, and how buyers are really relied upon by their end consumers to really be able to stock the right product, understand it top to bottom and really make a solid buy and feel confident about that. Can you please speak to that, Nick? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm a product person myself, so I, I really enjoy uh, uh, the product and, and being able to use it and, um, and getting out there. And, um, you know, SIA has historically worked with WWSRA to do uh, and produce the demo, um, you know, for a number of reasons, um, uh, we're not going to do it this year, not to say that we won't do it in, in coming years. Uh, we were really taking a, a good hard look at, you know, what, what the primary opportunities and, uh, and issues are around that uh, demo and certainly in Colorado, you know, we have a timing issue. Um, you know, uh, we have a weekend in between the show and when we could do a demo, a demo we have, um, you know, certainly it's difficult to get to the mountains. Sorry for the Colorado guys on the phone here, uh, on the call, but uh, that's an issue. And, uh, and then, you know, with the evolving um, um, uh, participation levels at resort, it's, it's, a, it's harder for us to take up that real estate at a resort, even on a Monday or a Tuesday. We're all hearing, um, you know, the good news around resort participation and, uh, and uh, what the multi-mountain passes deliver. But that being said, um, you know, we do see the value. We want to have a physical demo as part of the show. We are working with uh, Marissa and her team to, to rethink what that demo looks like. Um, certainly we'll wait to hear um, what happens uh, with the location of the show uh, before we uh, uh, further evolve that discussion. But, you know, it, it, is, it is fair and safe for you all to know that um, we haven't walked away from that conversation. Uh, we're looking to enhance that and figure out how we can um, uh, replicate that in a stronger, more meaningful manner. And that's definitely one that I think You'll be able to learn more about here in the next few weeks because there's a lot underway there. Um, the next question, and we're getting a lot of these also, is on timing. 
Historically, the ski show when hosted in March was a writing show, then moved to January to become a launch show. However, supplier lead times for certain segments has grown more so since COVID. Is January, the end of January, the correct timing? Who would like to take that one? I'm happy to, to basically say that those are the things that we're considering at the moment. So we are uh, getting honestly very uh, different feedback from customers. Um, and I, I do believe it will be difficult to satisfy everyone, obviously, because the feedback is so different with timing that is different by customer segments. And so it's something that, uh, Marissa, we have to take a really data uh, focused approach to this and customer centric approach, talk to customers, understand the needs, and then do our best to meet as many of our customers' needs as possible. But that is work in progress as we speak. So I can't comment on when the timing will be because honestly, right now we don't know. We're, we're still working through that uh, at the moment. I can just add on to that. Um, you know, I think what we, what we well, actually, let's take a let's step back. It wouldn't be a conversation around a trade show if there wasn't a date, a date, uh, a date uh, element here. So, you know, uh, thank you for asking for all of, all of you. You know, we are, and you all have gone through just unprecedented times and we're continuing to work through modern day issues around supply chain, manufacturing timelines, uh, materials, uh, shipping costs, et cetera. In a lot of cases, anecdotally, we're hearing members where timing is moving forward, moving up, you know, away from later and it's getting earlier. And, you know, so there are, a lot of opportunities in front of, in, in front of us. And, you know, it is a evolving discussion and, you know, we have to um, uh, really consider that. And, and as everybody mentioned, you know, not, not one timing is gonna work for all, but, you know, coming together as a group for all, as, as we discussed earlier, can really uh, create a lot of other opportunities around community. And so this is something that, you know, again, we're going to be working with Emerald and uh, an outdoor retailer and their team to represent our, our, um, uh, our industry's needs as best we can. And I just, I just want to say um, a huge thanks to Arabe and his team for listening and working with us in a collaborative manner to meet all of our needs. So don't think that um, this, is being, this is being discussed in the vacuum. Absolutely. So we are nearing the top of the hour and there's some really good ones coming in that I really wish we could hit. Um, I'm going to put a couple more here to close it, but then just know that um, I will ensure that we get answers to these questions sent out to you. They're fantastic questions and it's so great to see everybody really putting it out there. So this is a great opportunity. And thank you again to Hervé and Marissa and everybody for showing up for this. What a Monday, right? Um, okay, Nick. This one looks like it's for you, but I think it would be something either one of you could step in and ask or answer. I hear from many of my colleagues in the snow sports world that they think the show is too expensive and the dollars they quote about what they spend is crazy. We do two ORs shot two GOA shows a year for a lot, for a lot less and our business continues to grow and you can't place a one-time value on relationships, trends, and that kind of thing. Orders haven't been written at shows since the computer was invented. Why do the snow sports brands historically spend so much on shows? I'll jump in there. I, uh, I've had this discussion with this individual. So uh, thanks for asking the question. I appreciate it. And I enjoy the conversation with you. But, um, you know, we we have, I would say, you know, I'm going to date, date, date myself a, a touch here. Historically, the show really was about pomp and circumstance. And you're absolutely right. Since the birth of computers, uh, writing has has declined, if not gone away, uh, not 100 percent, but uh, certainly uh, uh, a big percentage. Um, but, you know, we went through an era and um, everyone on this on this on this Zoom call knows knows the era where, you know, the bigger the booth, um, you know, the bigger the bigger. Um, the bigger hype you had. And I remember working for a company in, the, in dead center with the biggest booth. But the reality is, is that is, in my humble opinion, that is not money well spent. That is, you know, that ship has sailed. And now it's time to be efficient and effective 
and really look to economize your, um, your, your presence and look at those relations, um, look at those trends um, as a way to enhance your business, enhance your relationship, um, educate your, your buyer, your media, um, have your employees um, um, enhance their education as well. So there are, again, it all rolls back into this community that we've been talking about. And, and I also want to touch on, you know, um, Hervé in, in, in the way that he is, you know, moving away from national show and, and trade show and, and that language that has such a, a historical hangover and moving more towards a marketplace and a true marketplace where we can do a lot more together than we can apart. And that goes back to my, my comments too. This, this fracturing is really going to cost our industry um, a lot of, a lot of um, resources and, and hard dollars to achieve a single result. So again, you know, great question. Um, you know, we can do more together um, and we can do more less with less. And uh, it's up to us to redefine that. And that's the essence of this, uh, this discussion today. Nick, if I could just add to your comments, um, research shows that, um, first of all, it is, uh, there are some differences by generation, there are dif differences by sector. But if you were to look at the average, uh, the majority of people go to, go to events like these physical uh, marketplaces to explore, to be inspired, to learn about what's new. That's the vast majority of people. That's what the, why they go. And so it's incumbent on us to make sure that there is a lot of new and that it is inspirational and they have a way to, to work and, and engage with brands that's different than they've done before. Other people go very specifically to learn. Others go to network. Others go to socialize. Um, and so there are very, very, uh, others go to just get lead, to, to, uh, to get leads. And so I think the days of pure, I think to your point, the days of pure order writing, or to the, the person who asked the question's point, are really probably not what we're going to see in the future. I think the world has evolved significantly since then. And we need to understand specifically what customers need. And with data today, we know what each customer wants out of that experience. And it's incumbent on us through data, through surveys, and then through digital, through mobile apps and so forth, to be able to uh, deliver a unique experience for that individual. That individual that wants to learn has to come and engage in a learning way. And we've got to create a learning path. The ones that are coming for socializing can get the same. The ones coming to explore gets a different path. And that's where I'm talking about the digitization using data that's going to revolutionize this marketplace uh, that we have. And that's the path. That is the customer-centric path that we're on and that we need to, to stay on. Super exciting. And there are so many great questions. We literally have 23 open questions still. So I definitely have my work cut out for me in terms of organizing those with the recording here, but we will be addressing every question. Um, there are so many great ones, including the role of the show in promoting DEI, um, a lot on climate and just so many more. So just know that we will be sending a really solid follow-up to you all. Um, and we'd love to invite you back, Hervé. Um, Thank you. To answer more, you've been so gracious. I'm pretty sure this is a, a first um, that we've pulled together here today and open Q&A with you at such an important time. So thank you so much. Um, I just wanna ask one more final quick question that I think will be really important for everyone just from an accountability standpoint. I'd love for both of you to weigh in on just how we can create, continue with this collaboration and creating actual action from this. Um, Nick, if you could start, um, how can we create ongoing collaboration and conversation together to create what is really needed and to execute on that? Yeah, great, great question. And, 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 and like you, I'm distracted by all the questions. I got a column here and I just keep reading them all and they're, they're wonderful. And, and it really speaks to the essence of this conversation um, and the importance of what we're doing here today. And, and, uh, and again, I want to thank Hervé and, and Marissa and the, and the and World Outdoor team um, for, for uh, contributing to this. 
you know, you have our commitment that we are not going to let this conversation go uh, go away. We're not going to step step away without hearing more. I mean, these questions are amazing, and uh, we will get back to you. But I want you to know, um, all the listeners out there and viewers, that you know we have an active conversation with uh, with with outdoor retailer. We are working with their team diligently. We have your interests um, top of mind and in looking at the future and how to best evolve um, this industry in an efficient and effective way is, is our number one priority. And I know that we have a wonderful partner with Outdoor Retailer in, in that. And, uh, um, and if these questions are any indication of how much you all want to contribute, um, we're going to continue to do these panel discussions and um, and get those questions answered and really get that sense of community based around this uh, this evolution. I would add to thank you, Nick, and fully agree. I would add a couple of things. One is that um, I'm I'm more than happy to be personally held accountable for the transformation. Uh, so I'm passionate about it. Uh, I'm passionate about the, the sector. I'm passionate about the, um, the, the industry and uh, more than happy to personally be accountable for the transformation. So uh, that means that uh, I'm going to ask for something in return, which is we will be asking you questions. We will be engaging in, uh, you. And some of the difficulty sometimes is not getting live and quick responses. So if I might ask you all is to please engage with us back because it is with your feedback, it's with your engagement and responses that allow us to build this new platform that we believe will be a better platform for the industry moving forward. So that's number one. And, and Kristen, I really apologies for this, but I do want to sneak in a DEI uh, response. Please do. Please uh, and do. I, it'll be very quick, but this is an area of real passion. And um, it's really important that we do this right and we're still learning. So we're testing in a couple of uh, our events. How do you engage with um, diverse community members, both on the seller and the buying side, create mentorship opportunities, which we've just done at one of our shows in the jewelry space, which was wildly successful, and how we can then scale that to some of our other shows. So really kind of just a, a, a tipping my, uh, my hat here to great work that was done by some of our team members and things that we believe we can bring to all of our events because it is absolutely critical that we do this right and it's important for the industry. And I think it will add immense value uh, to the platform. I'm so glad that you added that. And please know there isn't a single person in our audience today who isn't excited about what you can bring as such a you know, successful large organization that works with so many sectors. We are open to cross training and, and really seeing what's worked in other places because we really do want to see change happen fast. Um, we've seen it happen very fast in the last 18 months to two years. And we want to continue that in a way that's super intentional around this important gathering. And I just want to thank both of you so much for being part of this solution. I've never actually been part of an exciting conversation like this today where you just literally showed up and gave your best and opened yourself up to the audience here. And it's been amazing to be part of that. So thank you so much for being here. And I truly hope that this is the start of an ongoing collaboration. Please everybody know as we wrap up here right now, we're going to have a recording and obviously a lot of answers and in the future, as Marissa and Hervé and their team reach out through Nick and, and the organization of SIA, please, please prioritize those responses because I have a feeling we're in a really important moment right now. We have the ear of Emerald and obviously Nick has always been there as the ear. So let's take this opportunity and run with it. Thank you again so much for everybody being here today. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for phenomenal facilitation. You're really oh, thank you. a pro. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. All right, <laughs> Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Nick. All right. Bye.